Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO show. I'm your host, Kevin Appleby, and two guests this week, James Bannon and Suraj Tirupathi. Now, both James and Suraj are corporate escapees who are now running their own business, helping startups develop, make pitches, raise funds, and so on. So I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation around that. Suraj, what's your background? Kevin, I uh, studied engineering at Imperial College. So I'm, I'm trained as an engineer with a focus on audio signal processing and machine learning. I then actually graduated and funny enough, went into venture capital. It was quite a that's a bit of a change. Yeah, it was quite bizarre, but there, the explanation for it is fairly logical, actually, because I always had the intention of starting a startup at some point. So that's why I wanted to choose an engineering subject that was most conducive to that, you know, because if you're doing mechanical mm-hmm. or civil engineering, you usually need big plants and a lot of equipment to work with to build prototypes for any ideas you may have. Whereas if you're an electrical or electronic engineer, usually a lot of the things you can build start in your garage. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I really I was drawn to that idea as a 17-year-old before choosing what subject I decided to go into. Well, I started a business in my third year in university. It was sort of failing by the end of my fourth year because our exams had kicked in and me and my co-founder were spending more and more time dedicated to that. But I caught the attention of some recruiters on LinkedIn who were looking for entrepreneurial candidates for a startup, sort of like a personality accelerator called NEF, New Entrepreneurs Foundation, run by a charity called the CFE, Center for Entrepreneurs. So they kind of came at me and said, hey, look, you know, this is a program we think you'd be really interested in. You can start your own business while you do the program and also do a placement at a startup or a venture capital firm. And the idea of going into VC really appealed to me because I could understand how investors thought get a wide view of a lot of startups within the industry at the time in 2019 in London. So ended up doing that for about a year. And then I think it was three months into that, my manager once said to me, he said, uh, you know, if you ever want to actually raise investment, you need to have actual skills in industry. You can't just raise money. Do you know what I mean? You're not, you're not going to be able to just raise money for no good reason. And people need to know that you're the guy within, within an industry that has the skills to do that. So you need to prove yourself within an industry. So I thought, okay, interesting. So I actually went back to university and studied financial technology, where I then became a software developer and quantitative analyst within the, the financial industry. And it took about I don't know, let's say 12 to 14 months to realize I don't like working in corporate environments. So yeah. h- here I am now. James, you've got a very different background to that. You ended up in a a big venture capital firm. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, that's not quite right, Kevin. Maybe we're jumping a couple of years ahead okay. and our uh, future casting a bit there. But actually, there's a lot of similarities with uh so I had a story of mine, not just the fact that we kind of uh, overlap and we met at university. So I think from a young age, for me personally, it was all about technology in the sense of hardware. So more think like engineering, think engines, think cars. I've always had a passion for them. And that led me to study aeronautics at university. So that was more kind of thinking down the F1 route, um, thinking about vehicle dynamics, stuff like that, material science. I basically dropped all of that once I graduated in the pursuit of, you know, understanding the financial world a bit better um, because I knew long term, look, at the end of the day, you can follow your passions to a degree, but you need to have some kind of commercial baseline understanding, right? So I went in there, kind of self-taught myself all I could on accounting, finance, investment banking in the space of a couple of months, got my first internships and then converted them to a full-time role, which I was in for about two years. Um, I think... As to why I quit the corporate lifestyle, I kind of ran out of steam, if I'm being completely honest. There was this massive, I want to say, push and pull between what you enjoy doing and you know what you can be paid for in the moment. And I think there was that moment where I thought, if I put and invest enough time into the stuff that I really like, I can definitely get paid for it down the line and I could be successful in that down the line. Life does not have to be this kind of push-pull of me going to work, getting paid for something very handsomely but not really enjoying you know, 80% of the work and then coming home and in the few hours that remain of free time in a week, trying to like do my little projects here and there and you know follow my passions. And they came to a point of reconciliation where I said, I'm in a position now where I can kind of jump ship and put all of my eggs into the basket of working with startups, working with high level tech founders, 
going back to my roots and working with more kind of hardware products and mechanical products and really investigating the things that, you know, get me out of bed in the morning. What was that job in big corporate? Oh, so it was investment banking, purely M&A. So we were doing kind of technology and consumer. Generally speaking, the two are separate. So we'd have like your average consumer retail company one day, and then you'd have more of an infrastructure consumer company the other day. Think along the lines of kind of like petrol stations or big infrastructure projects. And then another day, we might be working with some kind of, you know, data analytics company or some brand protection software or anything along those lines. So it was quite a varied job. That was kind of the gist of it. And, you know, working as an analyst there, you do, I would say the good thing about investment banking is you do get a kind of associated with CEOs, CEOs, CFOs from that junior level, being able to speak with them, understand how they kind of strategize, converse with each other, the kind of problems they have, what keeps them up at night, all of these things, right? So as I said, I think I got to the point where I was like, I've absorbed all of I can before we kind of reach that inflection point where I'm going to be stuck in this career. It's now time to use those skills and apply it to a new industry. Mm. So the startup blueprint, what's it all about? Yeah, so basically started as a podcast because I'm a huge podcast fan. I listen to a lot. I have done for many years and I've told this story many times before. So I'll, I'll tell the abridged version that I kind of came back to my flat one night after investment banking. I had a couple of hours kind of early morning. I didn't really want to go to sleep yet. Kind of relaxed to a few podcasts, tech podcasts, think the likes of, you know, all in this week in startups, very famous, big names. And I was listening there kind of two hours in and I thought, you know, why am I doing this and being a consumer when I could be a creator? My immediate thought was that we need to start something here because we have a passion, me and Suraj, for startups. We want to eventually create our own startup. And we know plenty of people in our position that are working corporate jobs, that are kind of yearning for some life outside of it or to, you know, be able to be paid and be able to kind of wake up each day and follow what they dream about. So that's why we started a podcast really to give insight into the minds of entrepreneurs such that, you know, if you're just two or three sets behind someone, you have an idea or you have a prototype, you can learn from maybe people who have got seed funding or series A funding on what they had to go through a few years prior or any insights they may have that will help you kind of take your business and your goals to the next level. So that was the genesis of it. And it's basically since blossomed into this network where we kind of meet founders, we make connections between them. We go all around the world. So we've interviewed people in the States, we interviewed people in Far East Asia, Africa even. So it's going international. At the moment, it's very much, as I said, a community for founders to you know, listen, understand, learn from their peers. And we're subsequently growing it into a platform that we hope you know, will inspire kind of the next generation of entrepreneurs. So there's a podcast, there's a network. Where does the money come from that allows you to quit corporate? Well, that's an excellent question. So we do some like quid pro quo work, but we do also have paid sponsorships with the likes of, think of them like I think open VC, that kind of thing, where you have databases of venture capitalists, and then you can forward your pitch text to them to get either in touch directly with VCs or to have services along the lines of make me a pitch book, do all my fundraising outreach for me. And we also take collections or even like commissions on various startups that we will pass on to angel groups and angel syndicates. So what, what sort of things would you do in those commissions? In terms of you've taken a commission, you're going to ask somebody onto an angel group. What are you doing? Helping with the pitch decks? Helping with the modeling? Yeah, that's a great question. I would divide it into two things. I would divide it into deal flow and pitch decks. So the first would be providing the angel syndicates with deal flow that we get through our network. And that may be events that we go to, events that we run, people that we've heard down the grapevine that are starting something. Um, we have connections of the likes of or maybe I won't name names, but you know, various kind of entrepreneurial accelerators from across Europe uh, that we speak to and we can pass them to VCs. But yeah, you're right. A big part of what we do is the pitch deck work. So we can go into a lot of detail of this, but something that we notice is there's a real blind spot, particularly in kind of deep tech founders where they're, you know, ex-PhDs or they're really intrepid scientists, but they haven't been able to bridge the gap to commercialization or they don't know how to convey their product offering in the correct way, in kind of VC language, so to speak. So a lot of the time we'll step in there and we'll help them out. That might be brushing up their deck. That might be making a deck from scratch. That might be advising them on their messaging. And then on top of that, you know, passing on to any VCs in our network who may be interested. What does a good pitch deck look like? I'll I'll let Sarai take this one. Hey guys, good pitch deck. By the way, please do excuse me. I'm a very, I'm a bit nasal today. I'm just recovering from a fever. Good pitch deck is something that articulates the problem first and foremost, right? So if you're an investor, 
I mean, when I was working in VC, I think I saw maybe 400 of these over the course of the year. First things first, an investor wants to know that the upside into investing in your business is large. And that is evidenced through a significant problem that's felt by a big target market. Now, a big target market doesn't necessarily mean 3 billion people. It doesn't necessarily have to be a B2C company, but it needs to be a problem that a lot of money is currently spent on. So there's a huge market spend on that particular problem. And people are trying to solve it with some other method. And your method solves the problem in a more efficient way. But the problem is very real. And it's a problem you know, that people like to use this sort of uh, metaphor of vitamins and painkillers. So vitamin is sort of a preemptive medication that you can take that will not ensure that you don't have a problem down the line. But the real money makers are the painkillers where it's like, oh crap, everything has gone to shit and we really need to do something about this ASAP. So it's like, oh, well, look, I got this product that does exactly that. So it's like finding those problems that need painkillers. The second thing is defensibility of the technology. So, okay, you got a solution. Great. Well, how defensible is your solution? Why should I believe that you are the people or your product is the product to beat all the competitors out there trying to solve this problem? Now, what does defensibility look like? Specialist experience, time in industry, being internal qualities of team that could be defensible. Or the one that really would sell an investor is something that leverages data the larger the company grows. So it's like, right, we have X number of customers and we're collecting data and our models are actually getting better. Models or whatever the product is, the product is getting better the more customers that we serve. This usually happens with machine learning solutions, right? AI solutions where because the customer is feeding us more data, our models are constantly learning off the cuff so that five, 10 years down the line, we would approve our models for all the customers that are currently out there. So that's one, you know, people, it's like a, having your data as a moat. I've spoke to, I'm currently based in India and I've spoke to a couple of VCs here who said that straight off the bat. Says, yeah, I, re, I usually look for product enabled startups that have data as a moat. So I think that's quite interesting and it's it's clearly goes beyond just the UK. Other things is a good team. What do you guys have that others don't have that makes this a good product, a good unit to make things happen here? I hate to say it because this is what made me realize I had to kind of go back to university and get some more skills, but people that have industry experience, people that have been around, people that have actually interacted in the markets that they're trying to solve problems. And it's not, you know, it's certainly not like a a make or break because how many times investors are commonly proved wrong, right? But that's the thing that I think a lot of founders need to understand is that investors aren't there to take punts and fall in love with your vision. They're there to increase a internal rate of return. So we had a, me and James had a guest on our podcast very recently, and he was talking about people usually have this really, really pessimistic view of hedge funds. You know, oh, hedge funds are the worst people in the world. Like they're criminals. They're satanic monsters, right? <laughs> well, oh, venture capitalists, oh, we love them. They're great. They're fantastic. They're making the future uh, a great place, but there's really no difference. Both of them are trying to make money for their, uh, for their LPs, their limited partners. So you know, at the end of the day, investors are trying to pick companies that win and they're trying to maximize their chances of doing that. And some investors, particularly ones that have financial backgrounds, tend to look for operators that have considerable experience. Whereas, you know, when you go to the States, the mentality there is very different. One is a function of, I guess, American philosophy. Another is a function of it being a much bigger market there. And lots of entrepreneurs have become successful there and have become millionaires there and then gone on to start venture capital firms with their own philosophy and hence invest in young entrepreneurs with minimal experience. It happens a lot less in the UK. But those three things, I might have kind of waffled on a bit there, but I'd say those three things, right? A big problem, defensible product, and a great team. Yeah. Kevin, just to touch on that point as well, I think if you ask the question, what makes a great pitch tech? I think first you need to ask, why do you want fundraising? So yeah. I think a lot of companies now, particularly of the software type, you know, SaaS products, actually do not need or require venture funding. So there's been a number of people that we've spoken to that are looking for some kind of funding. And we say, actually, the first question you should ask, are you venture fundable? Why would a VC want to plug money into here? Can you bootstrap it, for example? I think before you go around pouring, let's be honest, hours into making a deck and a lot of time and resources and going on a fundraise, which we all know can be you know months long and very strenuous and kind of pull you away from your core business practices, Ask yourself, why do you want the fundraising? Who do you need to speak to? Are there any ways around it you could get to your goal? 
without outside capital as well. So these are all the questions you should be asking before you even kind of put pen to paper. That's actually a very good point, James. And it's something that Dan and I at Grow CFO have, have talked about on many occasions is we're putting a startup together that we are bootstrapping. We're not involving any fundraising. And yeah, we could, and we could have probably grown it faster, but we're not sure that we wanted the pressure on us to deliver things that the external investor would bring with them. And we're not sure that we wanted necessarily to have that fixed exit date that the investor would want because money in, at some point, they're looking for money out again. So they're, they're looking for some kind of market event down the road, aren't they? It's a fantastic point, yeah. And I would add to that as well, I think, a lot of startups these days kind of come to VCs without that crucial point. You know, they I think it's very well understood the kind of core components of a good pitch take, like tell a good story, attack the right kind of market, be very clear about your projections and where you think, how big you think your company can be. But I think a big part is the ask as well. How much are you asking for? Why are you asking for that amount? What do you see the money is being spent on? In particular, I think we've seen a lot of startups that kind of come, it's like, all right, if I just pour advertising dollars into this business. I'll see growth. And a lot of VCs don't want to hear that, right? Because it suggests you're more, your company kind of runs on operational capabilities rather than having some kind of intrinsic defensible nature to it. Uh, so that's another one as well. Really be clear when you fundraise, even before you approach VCs, like how do I want to spend the money? And will investors respond well when I say, okay, we need to spend on the team, uh, the marketing, the resources, the R&D, whatever it may be. So be very, very clear where you're going to spend money. So length of a pitch deck. What do you think that should be? It does vary. I was speaking to one of my, I call him a close friend now. Uh, We've had him on the pod recently. And he is looking for kind of a 1 million euro, roughly a seed round. And he works in cybersecurity. So this guy is very technical. You know, he's been in the cybersecurity space for 10 years. If we just go into a quick case study here. And he basically kind of, his first draft was 30, 40 pages because there's so much to talk about. You really want to go into the detail. You want to have links to your demo. You want to talk about all the different kinds of problems you solve and all the stats. And actually, I think sometimes a rough rule of thumb for any deck is probably 10 to 15 pages. I prefer personally a 10 pager, something that I picked up in investment banking as well, something that investors love, you know, from anywhere from VC to PE is tell the story with your headlines. So each page should be a new idea and you should be able to kind of just read the headlines of each of those pages. So 10 sentences, if you will, uh, and be able to understand the story of that company and what it's all about without even reading any of the fluff. I think sometimes, you know, people will just put a placeholder headline and then just have some like bullet points with all the details, all the juices in it is in there kind of buried under bullet point five. And that's not how it should be. It should be clear headlines and a clear story being told. He sent me this long pitch deck and I said, look, the VCs will only care about 20 to 25% of this. They want to know about your products, you know, how you're going to make money and how they're going to make money essentially. So what you can do is particularly if you have a technical product is to send a teaser deck. So that might be even, you know, as short as five slides, just to kind of shoot out to a lot of investors, get some interest in, and then have like a longer, maybe 20, maximum 30 page pack for any kind of highly interested investors who need to kind of dig into the technicals. Because we understand when you go to a presentation, a lot of the time VCs are very busy these days, you might only get 20 minutes which usually means probably a 10-minute pitch and 10-minute questions. You can't go into the details there and you can't be expected for them to really kind of understand the technicals in that short meeting. So maybe what you can do is send out a teaser so they get all of that information on site and you can bypass that kind of quick 20-minute intro and then save it for a longer conversation when you can really dig down into the details. Yeah. So in the audience that we're talking to here, as opposed to the audience of your podcast where you're talking to founders, we're talking here to aspiring and existing finance leaders. So what's your experience in the raising funds process when dealing with the finance person rather than the business founder? Personally, I've got a fair bit of experience with that because at the end of the day, the the firm I was at, 24 Haymarket, were looking at companies that were usually between seed and series A. So these are companies that are already generating revenue. Because if we were talking about pre-seed investing, the need for a financial cash flow statement or financial forecast, it's not really necessary because yeah. it's all made up anyway. It's no one knows yeah. what the hell's You've got going no on. idea what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So it's guesswork it, on a piece of paper. If anything, it'll just tell you how delusional or unoptimistic your, or should I say pessimistic your uh, founder actually is. I've had a, bit, a fair bit of experience because usually it's like this. And I'd like to add something to the previous question before I answer this one. When it comes to how long should your pitch deck should be, you got to think about what is the purpose of your pitch deck? Because the, the investment's not going to be administered purely your pitch deck. 
your pitch deck is to get you in the door, right? So James yeah. made a good point there. He's talking about have different variations of the deck. Because when you send someone a 40-page PDF, who the hell is reading a 40-page PDF? Who the heck is really going to do that? Seriously. Kevin, when's the last time you sat down to read a 40-page PDF? Oh, I've got a, a book on my bedside cabinet at the moment that's 200 pages long. I'm not doing much more than reading the... It's got loads of chapters in it. Each chapter's only a couple of pages long. I'm spending more time reading the table of contents than 200 pages of the book. Yeah. <laughs> there there, there same, we go, same thing. Right? It's the exact same thing. So it's like, you got to think from the perspective of the investor once again. It's like, what do they want to see? What are they trying? Because who who is it that's going to read this? It's probably going to be some entry-level investment analyst with zero to four years experience. And they're going to look for a few things to take off. Hey, big target market, good product, good team, correct raise amount. Okay, I think it's interesting. Let me get my manager to verify it's interesting, right? So it gets you in the door. now. If there's something more detailed, as James says, good idea, have your 30, 40 pages in a more detailed investment deck that you can say, if you're inter- if they've got doubts about the defensibility of the technology, then they'll say, we're not sure, but we'd like to learn more about technology. Then you can say, hey, well, actually, I have an investment deck that can send you as 40 pages. And ideally, what you'd want them to say is, no, we don't actually want that. We want you to come into our office and have a meeting with us in person. Bingo. Yeah. There we go. So yes. you didn't even need the investment deck, but you almost tortured them with the thought of reading it because they're like, yeah, you know what? We don't even want to read that. We're just going to meet you for an hour and that's way more preferable. But then again, isn't there something about going through the process of writing that investment deck? Yeah, of just course. Just sort out Absolutely. your own thinking around then because you've written it, you've asked yourself questions, you've realized there are places where you're exposed and you might well have done something about it during the process. Absolutely. I mean, that, I think that's the logic of, doing a business plan. But the thing with startups is that you got to be able to iterate and move fast because you might yeah. spend God knows how long writing a 50-page investment deck slash business plan. And by then, your idea has changed so many times because you had so many users actually come back and say, nah, this is terrible. We want this or nah, this. Yeah. And you, or you might just have information that this whole industry that you wanted to solve a problem in is the wrong industry. The technology you have is actually way better poised for this other industry. I think that the opinions are split. We had a guy come on the podcast, a good friend of mine. He said, you got to have a business plan. And I've heard other people say, who the hell is advising anyone to have a business plan? So at the end of the day, it's you have a business plan, do you not have a business plan? It's not really, you're not going to get a medal on whether you have a business plan or not. You're going to succeed based on whether you can actually attract customers, create revenue and generate profit, right? Solve a problem in the market. It really is down to individual preference of what you think is best for your business at that moment in time, I think. There's an interesting one that a lot of startups are pivoting, moving their business model around, moving their target market around, moving what the product actually does around. How do you take the potential investor on that journey? I think it depends, right? It it depends on the stage the investor is investing because they'll have their expectations adjusted based on what stage they're going to get involved in, right? So here in India, I've spoken to now at this point, four investors and they're all pre-seed and they all say that one of the biggest things we look for is a founder or founding team with great skills. We want to believe in the individual because we can supply and help them with resources, but we need to believe in the individual that they can make something happen. If we can build conviction in them, then the idea is secondary. So earliest stage investor would probably think like, should think like that. Because if they're thinking, oh, this is the idea, and this is the, this is what you're going to do for the rest of your life or the next 10 years, you're ignoring the sort of fundamental principles of building a startup, which is to iterate, fail, fail fast, and iterate quickly onto better solutions. Yeah. And generally, the nature of those individuals, those successful individuals, is going to be the, the people that, that possibly lose interest in things quickly, get bored with things quickly, will move on, will flip about a bit. It's just the, the nature of the kind of personality that tends to end up being a founder. Well, I think that's an interesting point because, yeah, you got to be able to adapt quickly to circumstances. But I think, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but inferring that the individual themselves has to have some kind of attention deficit is probably not accurate because once you really do find something that you can double down and you really got to zero you in. got to zero in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you got to know is, is that the something you've that seen, right. Kevin, out of interest? Is that something that... Are you speaking from experience in terms of founders you've spoken to? Yeah, I am a little bit. But I think the folks that I'm thinking about that I've got in the back of my mind do have that ability to double down, but also have the ability to have an idea and move away from it very, very quickly. It's, and it's it almost the, comes as being bored with it, but 
I think it's probably actually some kind of intuition that says, nah, this isn't quite right. There's got to be something better. It's the old adage, isn't it? It's frog opinions lightly held. Yeah. So you do need to really, I think it's very important for founders to have vision, obviously, but to kind of not change your course in the face of new information would be nothing short of stubbornness. And I think me and Saraja believe is that, you know, if you're willing to change your mind on something, it's normally a sign of intelligence. So I think the advice for founders is generally, especially if you're looking to really change the world and solve a big problem, maybe a deep tech problem along the lines of, you know, space exploration, the energy transition, climate change, and all of these things, it really, really pays to have a strong vision, but you do need to be adaptable and you do need to be able to think on your feet and take in new information and change your approach in the moment. However, that does not mean you need to change so much that you'd be thrown off course and um, kind of lose faith in why you started in the first place. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the times, I don't know if you disagree, Kevin, but you'll see companies that will pivot slightly within the industry or they'll change the target market or their customer based on new information or based on the new technology that's developing. But I personally find it quite rare for a startup to completely change and like correct course and change and go do something completely different unless the founder wants to shut down the company and start up a new one. Yeah. I am thinking about one person who's a good friend of mine who ended up having to do that because he just could simply could not get any traction in the original market that he thought he was going for, but realized there was a great piece of technology that could be applied to a different set of problems. Oh, so can I ask, did the product change completely? I haven't spoken to him recently. He was in the process of going through the pivot the last time, but um, I suspect the product won't have changed much at all, but the place that they're trying to sell it has changed vastly. That's very common, yeah. I, I would describe that as a pretty standard pivot. Uh, that yeah. makes a lot of sense, yeah. Particularly, yes. um, yeah, particularly when you, you you often see you know software that's geared towards enterprise. These B two B companies, enterprise is very attractive, purely because it's you know big fish you can kind of lock in a few of those customers and you're set for life in a lot of uh, scenarios. But then later, find down the line that actually this our original product is much more geared towards SMEs and smaller companies and startups would uh, be a lot more attuned to what we're offering. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about founders. What role do you think a good finance leader plays in this process in your experience? I think, uh, right. So one of the things I've seen, right, is that you're going to build a forecast of your cash flow based on historical cash flow, right? You're now looking, I assume this young CFO in their career is looking to raise investment for the company that they're with and to be sort of diligent financial planner of this organization. It's understanding the different pieces of the organization. How much is going to the different elements of what's happening? So how much is going to the sales team? How much is going to the market, the marketing team? How much is going to the product team? Now, for example, based on what the product team builds, what is our business model going to be? So I need to now, as a CFO, sit with the CEO, with her or him, and think, right, so we are built this product. Now, are, how are we going to sell it? How is that going to impact the business model with this new set of benefits for the customer? How are we going to package that up? Okay, so these are the different ways. We're forecasting then, how many sales are we going to make? How much are we actually going to sell it? All right, but then who's going to be doing the selling? Because we need to have some kind of push from the sales department. So we've got to allocate money there. So knowing that this is how much investment I'm going to put into my teams, and this is the ROI of the investment. And then building that into an Excel sheet building that into your statement. So then when an investor comes and sits down and says, hey, talk me through the numbers here. What's going on? You know, you're doing 3 million at the moment and you're telling me you're going to be doing 50 million for years. How? Talk me through this. And then for them, that person had to sit down and kind of say, look, this is the growth rate we've been going at. We're now opening these demographics. This is our, the reason why I have a 150% year-on-year sales increase is because of these external factors, first of all. And then we're going to be quadrupling our investment in sales. At the moment, it's just been the, me and the CEO, but we're going to be quadrupling our investment in the sales team. You know, As an investor, we're, of course, I'm going to be skeptical. I'm going to say, mm-hmm. how do you know your sales team will be that efficient? Why do you think your sales pipeline will just start increase by 10, 20 X just because you increase the investment? Who's going to be hiring the salespeople? Who actually has speciality in sales to hire these people, right? You're going to get the questions. But if you have a CFO that's taught about all these different things that understands the different layers, hey, this is the churn rate. Uh, these are our expenses. These are our scaling costs for the server. And you're you factor all this in. Somebody has a strong understanding of the strategic outlook of the business and how that correlates into actual financial numbers and can explain that verbally 
and you know someone is calm and collected. The thing is, it's interesting, Kevin, because a lot of times I've seen 25, 35 year old CEO, 55 year old CFO. But I've even heard investors talk about that. They say, you know, we like the CFO to have a few gray hairs on. Now, before everyone, anyone turns around and says, hey, that's ages. You can't say that. But it's like, at the end of the day, it's an experienced game because as a young person, you're naturally going to be more passionate. You're naturally going to be more invigorated to kind of take over the world and beyond. Where someone with more experience can kind of slow things down, sit back and say, I've seen this all play out before. Let's just take it one step at a time. So, you know, it's a preference of some investors. I don't think it's a necessity, but there's a lot to learn from older people in the industry, as it is with any industry. So I would say to any young CFOs trying to build their way up and become financial leaders, listen to the people that have experience in the game. Listen to the people. Listen to where you're optimistic and they're pessimistic. Why are they being pessimistic? Ask them about their experiences. You might draw a conclusion. You might say, nah, I don't believe it. You know, I hear your experience, but I think, I think it's anecdotal. I don't think it's the case all the time but at least absorb it, at least take it in. And at least when you're faced with the same circumstance, factor it into your calculation. Because you might say you might have the optimistic sales increase of 150%. Pessimistic might be 30%. But you might say, you know what? I'll give it about 50% as my pessimistic outlook. So I'm not that pessimistic, but at least you're taking into account a bigger a range of scenarios. And that's also really important because investors are going to do that for you once again. But it's important that you show that you can do that as well that estimate churn to be about 7% in my medium case, but in the worst case, could be up as high as 20%. Under those, and if you can create a financial plan, and remember, this is about decision-making as well. This is not just about hedging numbers and stuff and making numbers look fancy and, and fit a narrative. can to a certain yeah. degree be about that, but also it's about factoring into account different possibilities that could occur in this single reality. I suppose one, one advantage coming from that person that's got experience in the process is they will know what kind of questions to expect and therefore will have pre-prepared the right answers. It's almost like just providing the assist, right? Yeah. If we use a football analogy, I think what's important as well is, I think if you want to become a CFO or you're an aspiring financial leader, as you said, why do you want to be that? I think sometimes a startup only really needs a CFO if we continue in the startup world here. When you know you're in fundraising mode and the CEO's kind of hair is on fire and he's running all over the place like a headless chicken, trying to talk to all of the investors at once, and that's when the kind of role of a CEO becomes very outwards facing. And you need that point man or woman beside you who's going to actually have the numbers at hand and be able to step in and give you advice in your ear when you most need it. And I think to an extent as well, run the business day to day and have some kind of operational capabilities. If we're talking about a scaling company. The CEO, I think what I found is I did a short stint at a startup as well a few years back, um, a B2B SaaS, and it was probably between 50 to 100 people. And even in my short time there, you know, a couple of months, I saw it transition from a CEO who was very hands on and kind of clearly ran the business day to day to him appointing a CRO, so a chief revenue officer that took care of all of the sales team. And the CFO becoming a lot more of an operational person because he was out there, the CEO, setting the vision of the company and thinking more and more about where do I want this company to be in the next five to 10 years? I think when you're a seed company, it's very much all hands on deck. Everyone does a little bit of everything. But when you get to that Series A and beyond, you really need that kind of compartmentalization and clearly defined different roles. Yeah. I think what we've seen in Grow CFO is the the rise of a fractional CFO, specifically into that situation, as you're saying, you the early stage, you probably don't need the finance person. Even as you're going into raising funds, you don't necessarily need the full-time finance person. So the fractional person can provide a resource into that. But I think something changes between sort of trying to get the funds and actually having them, because now you've got an investor sitting there wanting to know how their investment's getting on know that you're putting certain things in place. Have you got proper governance in place? Have you got proper process and procedures in place? How safe is my investment? And the CFO has got to put their governance hat on to start off with and sort all that out. And you see fractional job turning very quickly into full-time job, into recruiting the finance team behind them. Is that something you've seen success with, you know, kind of outsourcing that CFO role? Um, we've got a lot of members who have that as their role. Yes. 
a lot of people. And there's there's a mixture as well. It's it's quite interesting to look because originally we were seeing a lot of CFOs exiting big corporate late in their career and then taking on fractional roles that may or may not have then occupied them full time. More recently, I think we've seen younger finance leaders decide that a fractional CFO career is the way forward for them. And they've set up a fractional CFO business with the idea that this is this isn't just keeping me busy as I drift into retirement. This is going to keep me busy for the next 20 years. Yeah, I think it just what you've just said there is kind of a microcosm of wider trends in the industry, right? Yeah. So people leaving more corporate style jobs to either I've seen that a lot as well when I worked in banking, kind of people leaving director level and above to go and start their own shops. So their own independent advisory services knowing that they don't have to do it via corporate anymore. And, you know, all of the power, the kind of level footing that technology gives us, the ability to set up our own shop and provide our own services direct to our customers without having to go through a a corporate intermediate, if you will, your employer. It kind of, it makes me happy to see a lot of people take this path as well, because I see it as kind of taking your career and your future into your own hands. Absolutely. I've done it. I've ended up doing probably 90% of my fractional role at the moment is in one organization, Grow CFO, because uh, what we're doing just grew so fast from the point that Dan and I first started talking to each other. But uh, I wish that I'd left big corporate years before I actually did. I probably clung on far longer than I needed to. And it was only actually when the, the organization was in real trouble and my job was made redundant that I actually took the plunge and, and set up my own company. But was that was it the nudge that you needed to think you wouldn't have made that leap without the situation you were in? I think that's probably the case. Yeah. And in probably the 18 months leading up to that happening, I had, had real fun because uh, I was working directly with the strategy and transformation director for the business. We were effectively consulting to our own company, trying to turn the business around. Now, the day then arrived when John called the transformation team into his office and said, sorry, guys, we've tried our best, but it's time that uh, we, we pull the plug on this. And sorry, you, there's no business for you to go back to. <laughs> it's rough. We just spoke to someone recently on our podcast who had a, a startup in the past that he had to shut down yeah, purely because it, it had failed. And trying to tell tens, maybe even hundreds of people that this vision that you brought them on and the reason that many of them must get out of bed in the morning has just kind of turned to dust and it's no more. Mm. It's not only hard to hear, but very hard to deliver as a leader, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely hard to deliver. And I think what you've got to remember through the whole process is that it's it's quite often not your fault as an individual that things like that have happened. Something that Graham and I mentioned frequently on the Next 100 Days podcast was both of us have been made redundant on more than one occasion. and. It's very clear to say that it is your job that has been made redundant, not you as a person. And I think in terms of the business, it's not the founder that has failed. It's the business that's failed. Thinking back to that particular last failure where we were trying to turn the business around, was it the business leadership's fault? No. They were put into a position that was absolutely impossible to deal with. We were a corporate who dealt 100% with government. 50% of the business managed highways contracts. 2010, there was a general election, middle of the financial crisis. We put in coalition government who had one agenda, austerity. And now the amount that the highways agency spent with us each year was more than the total UK budget for highways after austerity. And our revenue fell away so fast. Nothing we could have predicted beforehand that we just couldn't get rid of cost fast enough to help the business survive. That's a surefire way to run out of money. If your costs can't fall as fast as your revenue is falling, you very soon end up in trouble with your bankers. If you're heavily leveraged to start with, then, uh, then bank guarantees start being broken, things like that. And it's not very long before the banker is sitting on the finance director's uh, desk saying, sorry, where's my money? I'm going to put you into liquidation. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's especially pertinent. I think just to the first point you made as well, when it comes to startups, particularly young startups, 
it is very hard to dissociate the founder from the company because yeah. a lot of the time it will be one person or two people's kind of brainchild and you've poured so much time and emotion into it that it does feel like your purpose and who you are. Mm-hmm. And especially if you're kind of two, three plus years down the line on that journey, I can't imagine how hard it must be. It must be like a, a breakup in real life or almost like oh, losing yes. yeah. l- losing a friend or even a family member. It must be along those kind of lines. I imagine for some founders, I haven't been through it myself, but it must have been a time where maybe you could just reflect briefly as well, because it's just such a pertinent issue, obviously, with all of the big tech layoffs and stuff like that. And you kind of see all over LinkedIn, people struggling to find jobs and sometimes not even having backup plans in place. I mean, I think it's fantastic that you had something immediately that you knew, okay, I was going to work on this and I can finally take the leap. But a lot of people now look kind of desperate and scrambling around for jobs. So what was your mental state like in that moment? Was it one of kind of panic and desperation or was it more like, okay, my mind is clear now, I can now move on? I think there was some panic and desperation to start off with. I think it's a natural reaction to the situation. And I think you've got to be realistic. And I I took the view that said, hang on, I am either going to get another corporate job or I'm going to work for myself. I started putting CVs about the place and I started talking to recruitment agencies. And what what actually came up was a a halfway house that somebody came along with a a three-month contract, which needed a, a freelancer to do. But right, great. That's come up before any of these permanent jobs have. Right, I've set the company up. I'll go take the three-month job. And a three-month contract finished 21 months later, by which time I'd established all sorts of networks to say, where's the next job coming from and, and things like that. And I think you've got to take that very first piece of that with a very, very open mind and say, what have I got to do to survive? What have I got to do to buy myself some time? and not necessarily take optimal answers straight away. I completely echo that. And it's maybe something we didn't quite touch on as well, but it is a big reason why we started a podcast is because if you know where you want to end up and the kind of people you want to be around, then it's on you to create that network. Oh, yeah. Um, and yeah. in our case, that's you know anywhere from founders to investors to people interested in the startup world, to CEOs, to business leaders, thought leaders in certain industries, whatever it may be. You have to then kind of put yourself out and be in a position to just rub shoulders with these people every day. Mm. I want to comment as well on the point you made a few minutes ago on the way your company was wrong when it went under. I think that's such an important point these days. You know, we've seen kind of Silicon Valley Bank implode recently. And, you know, you hear all the stories of huge amounts of cash burn coming out the end of 21 and then startups struggling to even stay afloat in 22 and having to take down rounds or sometimes kind of close down. I just think it really brings that kind of governance aspect into sharper focus. And it's really in times like that, that you need, as Suraj was saying, a more like a level head, someone who knows the finances ins and outs, someone who could perhaps rein back maybe a, a, an ambitious or slightly younger CEO who thinks he can take on the world and actually just provide that balance. Yeah. I think on that thought, we should say thank you very much, James and Siraj. That has been a fascinating conversation. I'm sure we could go on talking for hours to come, but I've just noticed that we've run for nearly 50 minutes in a 30-minute podcast. We need to come to a close, but thank you for being this week's guests on the Grow CFO Show. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thanks for having us on. Thank yeah. you, Kevin. Pleasure. Yeah. 